Well, my next guest is Dr. Stephen Greer. He spent his career as an emergency room doctor saving lives, but you might know him as one of the most world's most foremost authorities on UFOs, extraterrestrials. Dr. Greer has provided briefing materials for sitting U.S. presidents, members of Congress, directors of the CIA, and more. The list is endless, and world leaders around the world um, about our these criminal, off-the-books UFO reverse engineering programs that are criminal. They're being withheld from us, done in secret, without the knowledge of the president, without the knowledge of Congress, without the knowledge of the American citizens. People have died. People have been kidnapped. People uh, have been murdered, mass murdered. And that's what we want to talk about. My guest is Stephen Greer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the show, doctor. Glad to be with you. And you're doing great work to get the word out. Well, likewise, and I, I, I want to thank you for your most recent Disclosure Project. A few weeks ago, of course, in Washington, D.C., at the, at, the, at the press club there, we, we covered it extensively on our show. And one of the things I want to talk about is that you, at, at the start of that, what you said was back in 2001, when you did the original Disclosure Project at the press club, one of the things you said was you didn't feel like maybe we were ready yet for this disclosure that people in congress and washington it just it, it they might not have mentally been there yet do you think we're ready now in the year 2023 22 years later we are ready now i mean certainly the american public and the the global community is ready because the majority of, of folks uh, believe these objects are real and some aspect of the government is hiding the information from them that's uh, in every poll is 50 60 percent uh more than any president has gotten in an election ironically uh, but i think more importantly the system in terms of what we've been able to do to get really detailed actionable intelligence and i mean granular detailed information to the investigators at the Pentagon, the Senate, and the House. They are now convinced there's a problem. They're convinced there's a treasonous illegal operation ongoing and that there are <clears throat> very significant uh, projects that have embezzled vast sums of money that have not only the, the technologies but are doing all manner of criminal activities in 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 the wake of it now this being said the mo majority of people working in those projects have no idea that they're involved in a criminal enterprise they wouldn't know that unless they had been involved in trying to get this information to people like the president <clears throat> excuse me and, and people like the ci director and senior officials in in the pentagon like the head of the defense intelligence agency whom i briefed who was totally shut out and told just go away now you know once i was able to establish those data points and facts the our group concluded that the project was unconstitutional and illegal secret government projects uh and therefore we declared them criminal enterprises this is the foundation in 1999 uh, in 2000 of the Disclosure Project. Uh, but we had to do a lot of work first. I mean, people need to know the context here. You don't just do this by decree. I had to have meetings with ministers of defense and secretaries of defense and uh, senior folks in the government, senior members of the intelligence uh, uh, community and the intelligence committees in the House and the Senate, oversight committee chairmen like Dan Burton back in the day. And all of those guys told me absolutely every single one of them, that they were curious about the issue, they had never gotten a briefing, and when they made inquiries, they knew they were either being lied to or they were directly threatened. So at that point, we concluded these projects were, in fact, a priori, illegal criminal enterprises. And so why do you think that these secret UFO programs, these reverse engineering programs, these human trafficking programs, whatever they happen to be, are being kept from us? I think there are two big agendas here. The twin pillars of this secrecy are one, the technologies that are being kept secret would instantly fix the global environmental energy and poverty problems. Now you think, well, isn't that a good thing? Well, it's not a good thing if you're part of a global elite, corporate and otherwise, mm -hmm. that benefit from the status quo of the system. Right. And we're not talking about a few billion dollars here. We're literally talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars. Because if you look at what the Pentagon confirmed a couple years ago, uh, and I've spoken to the Navy F-18 pilot, uh, David Fravor, about this, when they chased that uh, UFO off the coast of San Diego in 2004. And by the way, we have 3,500 pilot accounts like that, 3,500. But my point is, is that at that point, the Pentagon had to admit 
that it was a real object, they, that it was not using jets and rockets. And I tell people, I, every time I go into a meeting with someone in the Congress, I go, look at that object. That is an alternative energy and propulsion device. What does that mean? It means that everything we're using to go into space, rockets, jets, internal combustion engines, power plants using oil, gas, coal, solar, wind, geothermal, are and have been obsolete for the, a century, uh, the better part of a century. And, and for that reason, this is one of the biggest existential crises facing the planet and also America, because we're very dependent on oil from dictatorships and we don't have enough of it for the 3 billion people who don't even have any energy to cook their food with. There are 3 billion people, by the way, on the earth that are cutting down rainforests because they have to make charcoal. They don't have gas and electricity like you and I do. So this entire problem is artificial. It's a construct of power. And it's not because we don't have the technology. I am a scientist. I believe in scientific solutions to these huge problems. And we have them. That's the good news. The very good news everyone should hear is that we have these solutions. The very bad news is the people who are ruthlessly violent and uh, criminal have kept it secret with malice and forethought. And the second part of the secrecy has to do with the Let's call it, as the CIA director in 1953, uh, Mr. Smith called it, the psychological warfare value of the UFO subject. Now, what am I referring to here? 99.9% .9 of all news coverage, movies, internet sites on this issue posit and present a threat from outer space that is alien. This is nonsense. Those civilizations are not a threat. The problem are covert programs that are staging operations made to look alien that are a threat. Now this gets into a, a, a wider assessment of, and you have to go down the rabbit hole with me for a second. That's what we love if to do on had, the show, so please. <laughs> okay, all right, so if you've had 80 years and some of the most brilliant scientists I've ever met in my lifetime are in these covert projects working in skiffs and in underground facilities with trillions of dollars that have been embezzled from the U.S. government, but also from other sources, drug running, etc. You have technologies that are a thousand to five thousand years ahead of anything the legal Pentagon guys I meet with have, or that the president knows about, or that the Congress knows about. Now that is dangerous because it's an unregulated group doing all manner of criminal activities. Number one, but number two, they are able to stage operations tactically that to everyone seeing it would look like an alien event. Let's give an example. Some of the incursions over our own classified airspace, like the ones I just referred to uh, in a restricted zone off the coast of California, those were Lockheed Skunk Work aircraft, anti-gravity craft. Those were not ET. Those were not extraterrestrial. Uh, the people who have been, quote, abducted and the mutilations associated with this issue, those were all being done by a psychological warfare unit staging a threat from outer space. Why? They want to unite the world in a militaristic, global, sort of totalitarian state against the aliens from another world. That's the 70-year plan that Carol Rosen, who was on my team, who was the spokesperson for Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, uh, that it was clear when she saw that document back in the 70s, that this was the plan. And Werner von Braun said, yes, they have to stage a threat from outer space to unite the world around that threat. They had brainwashed Ronald Reagan to say that. If you remember, at the United Nations, he made that comment. Wouldn't our job of creating uni unity of the world be easier if we faced a common alien threat? So that narrative, which is completely false, who does that serve? It serves people who are power hungry, trying to accumulate vast power, not just in the United States, but globally around a false threat. Now, the reason we know it's a false threat is that I have people on my team who have been on the tactical abduction units using man-made anti-gravity craft that are made by my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Lockheed, EG&G. We know who's working on them. We know where their plants are. We know how the devices operate. And so when you have that capability and out of a million people, 
a million, you would, I don't think you'd find one person in a million when they were to see one of these objects and see the creatures they use that are the stagecraft to abduct folks, everyone would think that was an ET or an alien. It isn't. Uh, so now people go, this is a crazier story than the UFO story. And I, get, I tell people, 1991, a senior intelligence official reached out to me. I'm a young doctor. And he says, if you tell the people the truth, it is less believable than the fiction that everyone is believing because it's more bizarre. It's more strange. And I said, yes, I know this. And, and this is a big problem because it would be easy to stick with the narrative. That's the false narrative. So you have these twin pillars of the secrecy, keeping the technology away from the benefit of we, the people. And by the way, this is whether you're a left wing environmentalist Green Party person or a libertarian, this is your dream that you would have a, a box like your heat pump or smaller that would run your house or your car or your factory or your business with zero energy costs, pulling energy out of what's called the zero point energy field or quantum vacuum, which, by the way, Tesla stumbled across back in the early 20th century. So I think this is one of the big problems here is that you have to connect the dots. What I'm trying to do very quickly here at the beginning of what would be the compelling reason for such extreme secrecy that between 1956 and 1960, Dwight Eisenhower lost control oversight of these projects. It's because in 1954, they broke the code of what's called gravity control anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. They had these free energy technologies figured out. The industrial fascist folks dis decided globally, we don't want this out. And they have more power than the U.S. government, frankly, much more and more money in the aggregate. And they also figured that going down the road, if we're going to actually be able to build the military industrial complex in its excess form, not legitimate military, those guys are our friends then the way to do that is to have a bigger threat than the Soviet Union or terrorists or what have you. My big concern as this disclosure effort picks up steam and is being made official through inquiries and hearings and what's going on in, in Washington right now, they are going to get hijacked by this false narrative. And in 1999, I wrote a paper, you can see it on our website called When Disclosure Serves Secrecy. So the disclosure that they want to do is a false one that would unite the world in a sort of militaristic junta or, right. or dictatorship. Right, right, right. And that's what we have to avoid. But this is a very delicate issue because everyone, <clears throat> anyone who's gone to see the movie Alien or Independence Day or Googled this issue on the Internet or gone to a UFO conference or read a book about this, 90 percent of the information in there unwittingly in most cases is staged false events portraying extraterrestrial activity when it isn't. It's portraying the activities of this criminal organization that have the means to deceive very easily. Now at the Pentagon, we call this a deceptive indication and warning, but the pop culture would call it a false flag. Um, and you know, false flags happen all the time. We stumbled into the Iraq war because of false information on weapons of mass destruction. We had the Vietnam War greatly expanded because we staged and exaggerated an attack on our vessels, Navy vessels. My dad was Navy uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Tonkin. So this kind of manipulation has happened historically. The big one is coming, the big manipulation. And this is what we have to be very careful of, because really continued secrecy is preferable to, frankly, War of the Worlds and World War Three. So I think this is a, a very serious issue that needs to be talked about. And you have to lance the boil very quickly now, because uh, I know because I'm in Washington every week, <clears throat> uh, the House has approved uh, from the leadership down open hearings on this. And I'm working with some of those folks. The Senate now knows that there is an illegal operation going on and has passed out of committee an amnesty bill that we've been asking for since Clinton was president in 1994. Now, that's big news, because what does that mean? It means that we've, we've recommended and they've accepted that there be a period of amnesty that the very high value whistleblowers that may have done criminal activities, and we're talking in one case, chairman of a Fortune 100 company that's reached out to me, that they could come forward without criminal prosecution or seizure of their assets if they come clean and if they disclose fully and honestly. Now, the reason we need to do that 
is we, an eye for an eye is going to leave the whole world blind. If you go to, if you hit the nuclear button on this, your adversary, the, govern, the government of the United States, Great Britain, and every other country, this group ha has them outgunned in terms of technology. So you have to do this in a way that's very careful. There are very good people in that illegal black world that want to come out of the cold. I'm working with them. Yeah, they're, a good, number of they're them, good people. And a number of them have been, you, you featured in your most recent disclosure. Um, yes. Very good, very good people who've come forward. I, I, I can think of, well, oh, just courageous. Eric Hecker. Yeah. yeah, Eric Hecker, for instance, mm -hmm. who's going to be a guest here on the show, who worked for Raytheon, was in Antarctica. Yeah and was witnessing mm -hmm. some pretty remarkable things in, in Antarctica. I think it's so important what you just said. We've been hitting this drum on our show for, for a, a couple of years now, which is, okay. please don't be distracted. Yes, there are aliens. Yes, there are UFOs. There's reverse engineering of extraterrestrial craft. That is the case, right? Would you say emphatically 100% that is the case? Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. But the dominant thing that people see is the stagecraft. The yes. Host. So now so, they're fooled by see, it. And so there's the trick right there. And that's, I, yeah, I really, really, really want to hit on this. And so for people who are watching this right now who might say, ah, oh, this is a distraction and, and, you know, and, and this is the, this is the problem right here. What you just hit is the nail on the head for everyone to pay attention to, to not, would you call it a limited hangout there that that's what we're experiencing here, a psychological operation. Right, right. Sure, absolutely. It's a psyop, and it's designed. Uh, look, you know, Jacques Vallée, Doctor Vallée, who's been involved with this since the '70s, and whose uh, advice had led to the creation of Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Steven Spielberg. That movie, which was actually a docudrama, actually, right? Because Doctor J. Allen Hynek of Project Blue Book was one of the chief advisors and opened up files uh, for for Mr. Spielberg. But I think that. You know, he has admitted, although he, he's afraid to turn it over, that he has a document from 1985. And we can prove this. It's in an entry, in a log entry in his book from 1992, that he is in possession of a top secret document from the CIA describing the abduction of peasants, as they were called, in Brazil and Argentina by the CIA using man-made UFOs and fake alien looking things uh, for its, and I'm quoting, its psychological warfare value. In 1953, I have a document that was officially released to me after I briefed Clinton, CI director, where the CI director talks about this psychological warfare value of the UFO subject. People are going to have to begin to learn the nuance of this. We have, we're way past the point where it's like UFOs are real and there are extraterrestrials out in the universe. Now we have to deal with, yeah, that's been known for a century or the better part of a century. This is why the film we just released last week, The Lost Century and How to Reclaim It, is so important right now. And you can see it on Amazon and Apple and iTunes and wherever. Because that describes what it is that these guys have been keeping secret for 100 years. But also a very beautiful vision if we get it right. We don't do this wrongly. What the world is going to look like in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. Because the only way we're going to make it out of the conundrum we're in now with geophysical problems, environmental problems, geopolitical, uh, you know, massive global poverty, all the crushing issues. It isn't going to be solved by, you know, regulatory edicts from governments. Right. It's going to be solved by letting these brilliant scientists and these technologies come forward for peaceful use. That will transform the planet in a way that is bigger. If you were to add everything that's happened since the Industrial Revolution began 200 years ago to now, the release of this area of science and technology would be greater than all of it in the aggregate. Why? Because you're now addressing the actual fundamental way we live on the planet. Where is energy coming from? How do you structure your economy and social situation where every single village and individual has free energy, quote unquote, from the zero point energy field. These are massive transformations of our current situation, all to the good, unless you own the Saudi oil fields. Or the biopharmaceutical or, complex, right? Or the bio, so, yeah, all of that. So all of that, know, this, yeah. this gets into this gets into the classic definition of the roots of fascism. And that is big, powerful financial and industrial interests hijacking 
the interests of we the people. Thomas Jefferson himself warned of it, the unchecked power of these sort of folks. And that was in the 1700s, right? So early 1800s. Going through your original book, I mean, this book has been, I'll hold it up here. This is unacknowledged. This is my mm -hmm. copy from bookmarked and tattered from, from many years ago. Um, the, the revelations in that book were unbelievable. When you were a young doctor and uh, you were an ER doctor and you're, you're dealing with trauma and bullet wounds and, and all manner of trauma, what was the moment for you that transformed your life that you said, there's something bigger here and you went down this path? Well, it really, I went down that path in, in when I was a child, when I had a sighting of one of these objects when I was eight years old, uh, very close daytime. Uh, now, I mean, next week I'll be 68, so I was about 60 years ago in the 19, early 1960s, but uh, it, it, it ignited a lifelong interest. And then, of course, it coincided with my uncle designing and working on the lunar module, put the first man on the moon, allegedly the first man. Boy, so, first, he, was, I mean, he, was dealing, he was dealing he was dealing with jet thrusters and rockets at that branch of Grumman that became North of Grumman and his whole career was at North of Grumman but he wasn't read into the anti-gravity part I mean the, the things that were going on off book deep black so um, but he very much encouraged me to get involved and look into this because he knew it was real from things you, you know you hear things if you're if you're a, 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 a premier aerospace engineer from the 60s, working on the lunar module, you, you hear things. So uh, that's why he was so supportive. He's passed away. But, um, and so I, I began to dig into it. And the thing that really sort of disrupted my life, and not in a necessarily good way, uh, was when I was asked to brief the director of the CIA for Bill Clinton and found out that the president and he were being denied access to the project and in fact, I later learned that Clinton had been waved off and threatened by George H.W. Bush and told point blank, butt out, this is none of your business. Because he, George H.W. Bush was part of the committee running these projects uh, quite illegally and had been a former CIA director. Well, it and goes all the way back confused. to his, his father, to Prescott Bush as well. Sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely it does. It goes all the way back. Right. Uh, same thing with Paul Mellon. You know, we had Paul Mellon's grandson, Senator John Warner's son, uh, at our event this week, past weekend. Uh, and he very specifically said that, you know, his, his grandfather, Paul Mellon, was one of the richest men in the world to end of World War II, went over and brought back an, uh, an anti-gravity disc from Germany with Alan Dulles and George Patton. And when George Patton wanted to have this disclosed because it would benefit humanity because of the energy systems that it was using, uh, they set up an accident and killed him. You know, made it look like an accident. When you were talking with your That's uncle. That's what happened to George Patton. Yeah. When you were talking with your uncle about this, and Northrop Grumman, and uh, the disclosures and the, the revelations that you've had about the moon bases on people who've been to the moon um, mm -hmm. using these anti-gravity craft, did you ever have these conversations with your uncle about what you had then uncovered? No, because he passed away before I had folks who were firsthand, had firsthand knowledge of it. I suspected it. Because I knew that, I'll give you a date, October of 1954 is when we mastered gravity control, where we actually went from experimental craft that were unstable. If you look at some of the early UFO films, home films are fluttering like a leaf right, as right. they are moving. It's because they didn't have the stability of gravity control worked out from 45 to 54. October 1954, according to... Uh, the top secret uh, scientist at the Naval Research Labs, who was on my team for 15 years, uh, he was the top scientist there, had been in a vault and saw specifically that date is when we mastered gravity control. Now, my uncle was not read into that. And so I was rather agnostic about whether we had technologies when he was working on the lunar module that would have had that ability. But we later found, in fact, if you look at the disclosure material, uh, the, the, one of these objects that was at the Norton uh, Air Show in 1988 that we have uh, drawings for and a witness who was there, uh, Brad Sorensen, uh, he stated emphatically that that object had been through the solar system and it was operational late 1950s, early 1960s, um, and it had mercury component 
parts inside of it. So the technology of electrogravitic, it's called electromagnetogravitic or anti-gravity, that was pretty much under uh, operational f function by 1954-55. Uh, uh, by the late 50s, early 60s, they had that capability. And I understand eventually there were uh, uh, assets that we put on the moon that are there now. Uh, and I know one Navy SEAL who actually went on a two two week uh, trip out there on one of these devices. But these guys are, you know, the ones who have dealt with things at that level are very, very afraid to come forward. Uh, remember what you ever you saw at the National Press Club uh, last week on Monday, um, a week ago, that particular group of folks are the, the tip of a very large iceberg. So I have over 750 guys like that and a few women. Uh, most of them, now some of them, we have taken into the skiff at the Pentagon to be give their testimony uh, through the top secret channels that Congress established in, in December of 1922. I mean, 2022, uh, just this past December. However, most of them don't even want to do that. Of the ones who are willing to go through the skiff and give their information to the Aero Office in the Pentagon, and then from that, get it to the senators and congressmen, very few of them want to come out publicly because they're afraid. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're asking, if you look at my presentation, we're asking for not only amnesty for people who need it, right. but we're also asking for witness protection for some of these whistleblowers who feel they need it and also protection of their pensions. One guy that I have on my team, I've worked with for about six years, he was 10 years in a, an office at the Pentagon, in the sub-basement, dealing with this issue, dealing with the extraterrestrial part of it and the man-made part of it. And he had baseline clearance across 18 of these unacknowledged special access projects that were being dealing specifically with the UFO matter, uh, both the ET part of it and the man-made part of it. He signed a non-disclosure agreement saying that if he spoke to anyone outside that compartmented operation about it, he would lose his pension. And there was an 80 year non-disclosure agreement. Well, obviously he'd have to be 130 years old before he'd be free of it. And even though the Congress passed a means for these folks to give that information, it didn't have in the bill an explicit statement that that they wouldn't have their pensions. And this man is, is a war hero, got, had a terrible uh, event happen in, in the uh, Iraq theater of operations where he was had an IED. Uh, he's very disabled. His son has to help him even get around. Um, and he's terrified of becoming a homeless veteran if he speaks about this, even in a skiff. So what we need the Congress to do is a more explicit series of protective mechanisms. So that's the next thing we're asking for. But do you think they have an the appetite Senate. for this? I mean, I've had I've had Senator Marco Rubio on the show a couple of times, and and uh, in since that time, he's been much more vocal about wanting to get this out there. But here's what I worry about with some of these members of Congress. I'll just be very transparent about it, which is that they fall into the other camp of what we just mm -hmm. talked about, one of the other pillars of this, which is that they very much want the boogeyman. They want this because they are in the mm -hmm. pockets of the military industrial complex, and they want to funnel money to this massive military industrial complex. And I worry when I hear people like Marco Rubio, and I don't know his intentions on this, I need to, I would love to have him back on the show and dive more deeply into this with him, but which is, are you, are you putting them out there as a boogeyman so that we can raise more money, increase the size and scope of the Space Force, and now we have trillions of dollars in a military defense budget, and now we're going after the, the threat of, of alien invasion, like you said earlier. That's what I worry about with some of these members of Congress. How do you feel on that? Well, I don't think it's because, I, I think it's because they're being gaslit. So let me explain. Before February of uh, 2022, the only sources they had going up there talking to Mr. Rubio and others, I know for a fact, were people who were being dispatched from the dark end of this, uh -huh. providing false information. Uh -huh. The same thing happened to Trump and Pence, I know for a fact, because I know Pence's family, friends, and others. And they were, and, and look, 
if you're a, a senator or a president or a vice president or a cabinet member and you rotate in and out two, four or six years, right? Right. You're going to you're you're dependent on the briefing material of the best folks that you can get from the system. Right. Unfortunately, there are only two categories of people in that system. There are people who don't know anything and are sort of just pretending they do or they do know and they're providing deliberately custom tailored for that individual false information to manipulate them. That's what happened to Reagan. And that's what happened to the intelligence committee members. I know for a fact before we started giving the actual information. So I think people have to cut them a little bit of slack. And here's why they, most of the folks in the U S government and in Congress. Now there are a few devils in there that are on the payroll. Let's call it that way that are part of this group. But for the most part, they are victims of the secrecy. Most of the people at the CIA and Pentagon, don't ha aren't read into this and are victims of this. Uh, in fact, they're the most frontline victims of it, the Pentagon guys, and they now know that. So I think it's complicated. What I'm trying to do, frankly, my group is trying to do, and that's why we created this, uh, we call it Disclosure Project Intelligence Archive, the DPIA, is, is to provide specific actual intelligence reference to documents, direct firsthand whistleblower testimony and information. That's what I've handed off to the Senate and the House and the Pentagon and the White House uh, as of two weeks ago. And it's going to take a huge investigatory team to go through it, which I'm willing to help guide them through that. Uh, now, remember, I'm I have no official standing. We're doing this as a non-governmental organization. And frankly, it's a philanthropy. We don't get paid for it. I don't want to be paid for it. In fact, I wouldn't accept money from the government or a contractor to do this. Frankly, I'd rather have the public support it. We've been crowdfunded by supporters. It's fine. Uh, I'm retired as a doctor and frankly, I personally don't need money. So uh, at this point, my concern is getting this information to the right people. That's the true information and not the spun and spindled and mutilated information because that's uh, to be quite frank until it was way too late in the Trump presidency before we had a good access point to, to Pence and Trump. And by then the, the election went south and what have you. And, and the other presidents looked into this when we gave them information, but there was no groundswell of support and the, no interest in the Congress. And they abandoned it because they were afraid, frankly. I mean, Clinton's folks told me point blank, the people who lived at the White House with him came to my home when I was working in North Carolina as a trauma doctor said point blank, we're concerned he'll end up like Jack Kennedy. I started laughing. I thought that was nonsensical, but they said, oh no, they were serious. So, but now that the Congress has passed specific laws requiring an investigation and requiring that the Pentagon and the director of national intelligence give them information, uh, then now there's an opening. The problem with that is the people that are requesting this from at the Pentagon and the DNI, they're not read into these projects for the most part. And the ones that are, are going to lie through their teeth and do anything to, to spin it. So I think the reason we need to have, what did Eisenhower called it, an informed citizenry right. who yeah. understands this and is a check and balance to these foxes in the hen house providing false information. I will be very blunt. People like Lou Elizondo, he's a master of disinformation dispatched from the Pentagon to gaslight the American people and the US government and the media on this. We know this for a fact. The top CIA guy in history who's dealt with this issue contacts me periodically and said, as soon as that started happening, he says, oh boy. And he called it the Rat Pack, the usual Rat Pack that's gonna gaslight the American people, the media, and the U.S. government. Same thing with Chris Mellon. Chris Mellon was in there saying, gee, we don't know what these are. They're a threat to our national security. And I'm going, yeah, the man-made ones are a threat to our national security. And we do know what they are. Two things, man-made UFOs and extraterrestrial ones. Simple. Now, they know this to be a fact. Why would they be up there whispering in Mr. Rubio's ear this false narrative? Because they are being dispatched from this organization to do that. So I think this is where the check and balance of the media, like your show, 
and an informed citizenry and an independent operation like ours is very important because it's very, very in easy for people who are extremely busy, if you're a senator or a congressman or the White House, to rely on people you think you can trust, right. but you cannot, all right? So you have to be very careful. And this is why there has to be uh, more transparency. This is why I'm very happy that Congressman Tim Burchett and uh, Mr. Comer, the chair of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee and Speaker of the House McCarthy have indicated they want to have open hearings. The risk there is that those open hearings get hijacked by charlatans who go around saying the sky is falling, the aliens are murdering humans, and we need uh, World War III, all right? I mean, th th that's the big risk here because my mantra for the last year or two has been to these guys, a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Uh, yeah. And I've spent 33 years going down every rabbit hole you can imagine. And it isn't based on me Googling things off the internet. It, these are the, the our assessment is based on 750 plus uh, top secret guys who've had direct involvement. That number is conservative and I'll tell you why. Some of the most valuable sources of information are not in our intelligence archive because they will not disclose their actual name. They have a, a knock, uh, a non-official cover, or they have whatever, and but they're completely legit. <clears throat> Those people aren't even in there because we don't have a name to attach to that source of information. Uh, for me, I think the big trauma of my life has been debriefing or, you know, hundreds of these guys and finding out what they know. Uh, but if they don't come forward publicly, all I can say to the public is, I'm telling you the truth. You can look at the first disclosure project and since then the other. So we have something like 70 or 80 named firsthand witnesses that have come forward. It's on our YouTube channel. It's in the book. The book before that one was called Disclosure that has more information than unacknowledged, by the way. Right, right. So uh, we actually have five books. That's the fifth one. There are right. four others. Right. Okay, so I think that what we've tried to do, and our YouTube channel has 300 and some videos, about 70 of them are these top secret witness testimonies, name, rank, serial number, there they are. But it's so much information, the big problem with the White House folks and Congress, you got to distill it down into an assessment and what have you. Uh, and that's really a big task. It's, it's, it's harder to do this if you had nothing than if you have what we have, which is, you know, 10 to 20 terabytes of data we're trying to distill into something digestible. What would you like to see from these public hearings other than char keeping charlatans away? Would you like there to be a clear path forward. I'm, let me just tell you what mm -hmm. I would like to see, and you can tell me if it can point yeah. if it's similar yeah, to tell what me. you would I'm like to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see, yeah. I would love to see someone come forward who's credible, mm -hmm. someone who you've you've vetted, you've talked to, maybe somebody who's you featured in your books, you have the, the testimony, maybe someone who hasn't publicly come forward yet, but now has mm -hmm. this protection of asylum that's able to come forward, is able to show in front of a public hearing, uh, these are the craft that I've been working on, here are the photos. Mm -hmm. Here is the video evidence. Here's what I've been working mm -hmm. on. Here are the materials. This is what we've been building. And here's how it's gotten away from us. And here's how it's been used against us. And I haven't felt, I haven't felt good being able to come forward. I felt very threatened. I didn't realize I was a part of this darker project that's being used. Um, and I've mm -hmm. been used. And here's, what, here's, here's my experience. That's a piece of what I would like to see. Well, no one person, here, here's the other thing. If you understand TSSCI, Top Secret Special Compartmented Information, and SAPs, Special Access Projects, it's highly compartmentalized. Right, so the not one person value, is going to come forward and be involved in all, every piece of it, right? It's like people that work at Apple. No one's worked on the iPhone completely. They were pieces of this, right? And who all worked correct. in different, different parts of it. Yeah, so, so imagine that on steroids. Imagine mm -hmm. that a thousand times more compartmentalized. So what you do have though, there are some people more at the top management that I have been dealing with. They want to come forward, but they're, I'll be very blunt. The most recent one has had his entire family threatened with being killed if he spoke any further. Okay, so, and this is the chairman of a Fortune 100 company that has the documents and can prove the free energy. Now, in terms of people who have been at these skiffs, 
a secure compartmented information facility or a DUM, a deep underground military base working on extraterrestrial vehicles. I will tell you that if you took a piece of paper and accidentally threw it in a trash can, there would be a, a, like a SWAT team that runs in and pulls it out and says, you cannot put that in the trash. No one is walking out of those facilities with what you just described. The, the only people who think that's pop, possible are people who've never been in one. And I frankly have been in them. So you don't, you don't walk in, you don't walk in with anything. And you don't walk out with anything full stop. Now with actionable intelligence, a Pentagon and FBI strike team, can go in there and get this. And that's another avenue. Hmm. And I won't say more than to say that is being planned. Wow. Heads up. All right. But they have to know where they're going and what they're going to go up against. So one of the things we have to do is give them, all right, you want to talk about, let's talk about a facility, the Dugway Proving Grounds. What sector of that vast complex have the assets we're talking about? Where is the gate? What is the code name and the number of the building where the ET vehicles are? Right. Where is the entry to the underground work zone? Now, we have people who have that information. It's in our archive. It's very sensitive. But it's so the question is, as a private organization, I'm not going to move in there. You know, with I don't have the assets to move in there. The U.S. government does. The U.S. government does. Now. So I think at a certain point, what we want to have happen over the next six months or so is a process where this is being revealed to the people who should know. <clears throat> they then make a decision to protect the witnesses, but also they order these corporations and paragovernmental operations that are being run illegally to come in from, the, uh, from their illegal status and be under proper control and supervision or another action is taken, right? The amnesty expires, number one. Then there are actions taken that I don't want to go into any more than that because I'm, I've been just advising on this, where the actual intelligence of where the specifics of the facility, what the security, SecOps, security operate protocols are, all that are known. And, and so that it can be done safely and uh, effectively uh, and quickly. Because if this isn't brought under control through legal oversight process in the next six to nine months, my understanding a clock has been put on it by folks who are quite fed up uh, at the, that level of the legal government where they now know. Now see, before we started providing all that information, they didn't know A, it was the subject real, B, who was supervising it, D, what assets that they have technologically, et cetera, and so on. So this is a very steep learning curve. If you're going from zero to warp speed, but now that they've been brought up to speed, there is a serious effort being organized to correct it. Some of it you're going to see in the media, some you won't. And the stuff I have to do, I wish I didn't have to do it. But yeah. the, the fact of the matter is, you cannot let a monstrous illegal operation like this go on indefinitely involved in things like shipping women and children in crates for human experimentation at covert facilities. Well, that's All what right? I wanted to Which ask you. What, if you mentioned that you have the CIA or the FBI be able to go in and infiltrate these places. How can we trust them? Right. That's what I worry about. You have Jim Caviezel this week coming out. He's, of course, playing. Um, he plays uh, Tim Ballard in this new film on human trafficking. And he <clears> said the CIA is the biggest purveyor of human trafficking in the world. And so if you're if you're using these craft for nefarious purposes, how can we how can we find the right people to go in there and bring <laughs> these things down? That's the that's the tough part. Here. Because, but, <clears throat> well, it isn't because it's, it's very clear if somebody is a have or a have not. I'm using a term from a, uh, a Department of Defense person who's, who called he and his team the have nots, the people who aren't in those projects, hmm. who know that they should have oversight. <clears throat> and the, by virtue of the fact that they don't know, and aren't read in, they are by definition on the right side, ironically, hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I, I know right. it's, it's counterintuitive, right? but uh, so sense. now, you know, there's always the chance for an infiltration of a mole, 
right. or someone who's a counterintelligence operative. But to be honest with you, I'm going to know who those folks are, and I'm going to know I'm going to know by who they are and what they do and what they say. Hmm. And that, and in my team, the instant that that is shown, that person becomes a persona non grata. Hmm. So, uh, you know, we're very strict about it. That's no deception. You have to be a straight up guy, uh, honest, uh, and any indication otherwise, none of the games, any of those games out, you know. So it's got to be structured very well. Now, this is the problem with politicians is that they have a lot of people who are going to come to them yammering, as we talked about. And I think that out of the system that's there, almost everyone that's going to get into their orbit are going to be disinformation folks who are going to gaslight them. So the only way I see around that, this is why we've asked for members of the community, the public, to write their members of parliament, if they're in Europe or some other country, or their member of Congress and their senators in the White House, reference the Disclosure Project Intelligence Archive and recommend that they get briefed thoroughly on this by people, myself and people on my team. Because I, you know, under the right circumstances, you know, like the guys you saw who came forward, like the Marine, uh, Mr. Herrera, who came across this big anti-gravity object offloading uh, illegal weapons and also uh, apparently human trafficking. He initially thought those crates were drugs, but uh, a person who is a knock um, who had been involved in those operations says, oh no, those crates are for people and here's how we're using them and here's where we're using them. And of course this was, he was in tears, I was in tears. I said, oh my God, you know, we, we know that they're involved in drugging, running illegal drugs. That's how you get a lot of the cash. But the fact that there are innocent uh, women, men, women, and children of a specific type, I don't want to go into it, certain capabilities that they take and are then used in these horrific um, pro projects, most of them die in the process. Um, that is going on. It is not a myth. It is real. It's criminal. Um, and uh, it's, it's very scary because uh, when you have some, an organization that can use classi under classified cover, top secret, compartmentalized, with those kind of aircraft and this kind of intentionality and motive, unchecked, as Senator Inouye said, unchecked by the government, unchecked by the president, unchecked by the Congress, unchecked by the bosses at the Pentagon, uh, you're in a very, very dangerous situation because you're not dealing with jet aircraft and Sikorsky helicopters. You're dealing with, or Chinooks or whatever, Blackhawks. You're dealing with very advanced technologies, they call them ATs, uh, that have been reverse engineered and studied for since the 40s. Uh, and they're in generation, multiple generations of refinement from the 40s to the 50s on those technologies. But you're also dealing with weapon systems that are electromagnetic pulse and scalar, so-called scalar weapon systems that are way outgun anything a B-2 stealth has or a kinetic missile or a laser. And you're also then dealing with uh, let's call it uh, deceptive indications and warning stagecraft to stage events where it looks like the conventional U.S. would encounter an alien force when in reality it's this covert human group because they have that level of technology to simulate hmm. alien. Are we working with So aliens? all of this gets, you know, this is complicated stuff. Uh, it's sort of like the la if someone were to write a novel on what happened on 9-11, with those towers falling, no one would have believed it. It would have right. been such rubbish. After it happened, people said, you wouldn't have believed this if it had been a novel. Everything I'm telling you is true, but it seems absolutely over the top unbelievable. Well, yeah, but when you talk about moon bases, when you talk about moon bases and you talk about Antarctica and the secret bases in Antarctica, and we talk about working with aliens, it sounds fantastical and people can't wrap their brains around it, but it's true. I know, yeah, it it's, is true. It's amazing. Are, are we working with aliens right now? Are we, does the United States have a relationship on these black bro, uh, project programs working with extraterrestrials? There are people in those operations who think they are, but what they're actually working with are another compartment's man-made ones. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So, so now we're getting into my domain of very high-end electronics, high-end bio nanotechnologies, um, biological systems and what have you. 
we don't talk about this much, but if you are only read into a certain level of this and you're at Area 51 and you encounter something, you're going to think it's an ET and it isn't. Um, so this gets to be a rather complicated hall of mirrors. Hmm. And uh, it's whatever you think this covert human group might have, multiply it times 20, 30, 100, and that's what they actually have. So, uh, for example, there's a facility in the center of Australia near Pine Gap and also at the Four Corners area in Dulce where these creatures are manufactured. I know physicists and people who worked on them. They look like aliens. They would fool anyone. So if you run across some of these critters in an uh, underground base, you're going to think, oh, my God, there's a group of these aliens working with. Well, no, they're not. Uh, now, in the 1940s and 50s, actual extraterrestrials did reach out. And my understanding, Eisenhower had a meeting and so did Truman with actual ETs where they were asking that we stand down the proliferation of these nuclear weapons because when those are detonated they release an uh, electromagnetic pulse but they also attending with that piggybacked on it is a scalar pulse that totally disrupts interstellar communications and travel this gets into some of what dr zahari talked about at our conference that weekend before the national press club event and by the way that entire two-day conference is available in a webinar on our site if you want to see it um, and also what eric hecker was talking about with the neutrino light systems these are not at speed of light these are at multiples of the speed of light so the ets did appeal for us to stand those down and we're offering to help but eisenhower lost control of the whole process after 1956 and that endeavor went sideways i know the history of this very well uh, back in the 90s, the first gathering of top secret witnesses we had at Asilomar in California, uh, there were folks who literally had been at the Roswell event still living and had been involved in that Eisenhower era. They're dead now, uh, but we have their testimony. It's in the archive. Well, that's why on his, his, final, his farewell speech, he knew that this had gotten away from him. Right. I mean, this oh, is totally. him, him, yeah. him admitting, you know, beware of the military industrial complex. And, and he was he had he was aware at that point that had get, it had already gotten away from him. It had metastasized. Um, and I want to point out here that that view does not. Indicate an anti-military or anti-government uh, stance. It's talking about the illegal part of it, hmm. because, uh, you know, I want to be very clear. The biggest support we have are very heroic military guys like you saw come forward uh, and many of the worst victims of this secrecy and this right. secret organization are military and intelligence people, even CIA people. It's highly compartmentalized. The big problem, same thing with the aerospace industry. There is a lot going on in the aerospace industry that's legitimate. So you cannot throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. You have to have a discernment to understand where you've crossed the line from legally overseeing operations, even black budget. I'm working with a guy who literally manages the black budget of the United States. He was never read into this, never briefed on it. Wow. Okay. The top guy. All right. So because of that, because of my experience with that, I tell people to be very careful about painting everyone with the same brush. Right. You cannot tar and feather everyone because in reality, it's a relatively, it's a relatively small elite, uh, very, very compartmented criminal operation. And there are people in that operation who are just, yes, sir, you know, they're going to do what they're told to do. They're not people who are part of the management. And frankly, the guys I'm working with who even they've been in there for 10 years, they had no idea that the management of it was at the top completely being run illegally because they're in a compartment operation doing as they're told whether they're a scientist or whether they're someone in an aerospace industry or a, a delta force guy or a navy seal they're doing what they're told to do they don't know that the president and the congress and even some of the top brass at the pentagon have been decapitated from this that has been completely severed and that's the problem that has to get fixed. 
because an unsupervised entity that has this kind of top technology and malice, uh, and frankly, I, I will be blunt with you. I had a conversation with one of these uh, non-official cover guys uh, a couple weeks ago. He says, the people that are recruited into that end of it are screened for being sociopaths and psychopaths. That's how you get Period. into it. To yes. be on your resume, your, you have to be a psychopath. Yes, you have to be, you have to be smart, you have to be capable, but you have to be a sociopath wow. or a psychopath. So that is your entry ticket right there. And that is screened very, very carefully. Uh, and this is why, you know, when I briefed uh, in, in there in the United Kingdom, uh, Lord Hill Norton, who was a five-star admiral, he used to call him a sea lord. <laughs> he had been head of the Ministry of Defense as well as the head of the military committee at NATO and MI5 and MI6. He told me that he was never read in and he was furious as to why. I said, Admiral, with all due respect, what would you have done if you had found out there was a criminal operation doing all these things that you and I just talked about? He said, I wouldn't have stood for it for a bloody damn minute. And he got, he jumped up out of his chair. I was at his home out in Hampshire. And I said, sir, that's why they didn't tell you. They knew, I call it, I'm a doctor, so I call it a soul biopsy. They did a psychological analysis of you and knew that you were a stand-up guy, patriotic, honest, you would not have stood for it. In which case they would not read you in because you wouldn't stay on the dark side of the law, on the illegal end of it. And you would have blown the whistle on it, then they'd have to probably kill you or do something to neutralize you. So that is the criteria. And it's very simple. People make this very complicated. It really isn't. You have to have certain capabilities and a certain sociopathic willingness, willingness to do uh, very immoral and illegal things. Well, that Period. comports with That's what it. I've heard from from other from other uh, insiders who've talked to me about the the people that were marshalling them around or handling them, uh, using that yep. terminology, handling them. They describe them as psychopaths, yep. psychotic um, people. Oh, who could like look yep. through. You almost like could like look through them. Mm -hmm. They were so dark. These types of people, mm -hmm. um, and I've heard that multiple times. And yet, in those systems, like this guy who's coming forward, who's a knock, he is actually not a sociopath, but he's got brought up through the system he's over on that other side right so and, and, and a fairly high level right so the question is those sorts of folks they need to be protected they need to be empowered to assist with this process and what i'm worried about and i've said this to the folks who are advising the senate and the house that i deal directly with them is that you need to put these provisions in an amendment to the defense authorization act uh, that very clearly provides not only the protection for pensions and amnesty, but physical protection for the folks who want to come forward because they have families. Right. You know, and some of them have children that are still uh, minors and they are afraid. And I said, look, if you're working with my group, you don't need to be afraid because I'll just say this. We have it in place that anyone touches anyone helping me do this. It's a mutual assured destruction button. Anything happens to us, those guys are gone. Hmm. They're done. Done. Look in my eyes. This is what the truth looks like. They are done. So, but it doesn't absolve the psychology of people who have been intimidated, have seen people thrown out of helicopters. You know, like Mr. Herrera, the Marine in Indonesia. He was flat out told, we're going to execute all of you if you ever speak about this. And if you look at the email we presented that one of his buddies that he tried to get come forward with him when I was bringing him over to the skiff uh, at the Pentagon or, or handing him off to be brought, uh, they said, I don't want you to tell me anything about this. I, this is too dangerous. I have a family. So look, I think here's another problem with people in Congress and the White House. They don't think that the entity that is managing this is that sociopathic they haven't gotten that memo yet they 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 can't believe honestly this is it's a matter of, of of getting it into your paradigm because they've gone from thinking like mr rubio and others in congress were going well maybe that thing that we were chasing off the coast of california were from china well it came out of the lockheed i know the in, i can show you where it launched was launched out of the desert in the mojave desert we have a photo of it we showed it to the whole public. It's the there. Chinese balloon. Yeah. 
Yeah, no. So here's the problem. You go, you, they went from that to now accepting the fact that these are real, that there are extraterrestrial and man-made, and it needs to get under control. But they ha aren't quite all the way there yet in understanding the capabilities of this illegal the secret government group and their intentionality. Because most people are not sociopaths. It's only four and a half percent of the US population are sociopaths and psychopaths. So 95 plus percent aren't. Now, as an emergency doctor, I'll be frank, I dealt with plenty of sociopaths, murderers, rapists, mass murder, I mean, horrible things I don't even talk about. Every day, all day, day in and day out. But most people who are lawyers and businessmen and they're in the government and they're bureaucrats, they kind of live in a Pollyanna world where I think they honestly can't get their minds around this level of depravity and criminality running under cover of top secret clearances in a paragovernmental entity because it's a hybrid. This group is a hybrid of corporate, financial, not just U.S., but around the world and military and intelligence operations. So you have to look at it as a hybridized entity. Interestingly, if you approach it from a FOIA point of view from the government, they'll just say it's all in a, in a corporate entity that you don't have access to FOIA. If you approach it through a, 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 a private sector, they'll say, well, this is governmental top secret operations because we're a contractor. They wall it off. They're very clever at these little games they played where they've been able to outfox the Congress and the Pentagon overseers. Uh, for 80 years now. Well, it's my great hope that we will see some major movements on this. And I think, you know, we are no small we part are. to the amazing work that you and your team have done on this, really. Um, and uh, well, we need your help. You know, I'm, I'm here's here's my appeal. There are people listening to your show right now or who know people who are part of whether it was incidental or not, like Mr. Herrera or Eric Hecker or what have you. Um, or even higher up folks that need to be networked to us. I will assure you that if you don't want your name disclosed, look, I stand in front of the public and disclose only what the people who told me I can, I, it's like doctor patient confidentiality. They can approach me and we will see that your information gets to the right people at the Pentagon and in the Congress and White House. Um, I'm working with a guy at the White House military office on this specific on point. Uh, so I think that we'll do that. If you want to come forward publicly, we'll make that happen. Uh, or if you just want to provide me information and not go through any of the above, but if you think it would be useful for me to have, then I would appreciate it. The other thing we need from the public are is funding support. And I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I'm a retired doctor. We're doing this, if you can imagine this entire project with all the work, we have never had a staff or an office. It's all volunteer. My wife and I, my wife will be 75 years old this, this December. We do this out of a corner of our living room, out at our, our farm out in Virginia. And it's a labor of love, but we need help because what we're doing, like when people come, when we bring people to DC, the disclosure project is paying for their airfare, their security, their drivers, their hotel, everything. We're picking up all that, um, all the research we're doing, all the briefings, the meetings that we go all over the country to meet with folks. That's all out of pocket. We need people helping with the funding on that. And on our website, there's a, a button you can hit and make a five dollar contribution if you want or, or more. Uh, and the other is get your friends uh, link, link your show uh, to the National Press Club event, but have everyone else link it because because of the ownership, the, the ownership of big media is in the hands of this corrupt enterprise. I'll be very honest with you. Shows like yours and this sort of network that can happen through the internet, social media, that's how we get this information to hundreds of millions of people. And by the way, that's why we've done these documentaries. The one that just came out last week, uh, it's already, uh, it's number one in the world. It's called The Lost Century and, and how, how to Reclaim It. It goes through the whole arc of history of the technologies that have been kept secret. And also, more importantly, what do we do to fix that? How do we bring those out so it benefits humanity in our lifetimes? You know, because, hey, I have four children and 12 grandchildren. I'd like to see them have a world better than what we're leaving them right now. But the only way to do that 
I wouldn't count on the government or a big corporation disclosing these sciences. I think it needs to be an independent group of people who do it in a high tech physics lab and engineering effort. Now, this is going to cost 50 to 100 million dollars, which I certainly don't have, but the, collectively we could do it and then open source it. What do I mean by that? We release these technologies so that there's no patent, patent office will seize them. And it's done so quickly, it can't be struck and seized by a national security operation. Why? Because the only way you can bring these technologies out, if you do a normal Silicon Valley or venture capital effort, and you're keeping the technology secret, by the time you begin to stand up distribution on it and, and manufacturing, it will have been seized. And probably everyone involved may have been killed. So the only way to do it is with the whole world watching. The moment you get breakthroughs in these technologies from an energy lab, it's released over the internet through blockchain and the plans, everything goes wide. Uh, that's our plan. Uh, now the other request, I think at any given time, uh, there's probably a dozen to two dozen of these devices that are free energy, zero point quantum vacuum technologies which is basically for your listeners, extract energy from the fabric of space around you. Um, it's estimated that the volume of space inside a coffee cup has enough potential energy to boil off all the oceans of the world. But the question is, how do you tap it? How do you tap that? Right. That That's the trick. And it's VHV, it's very high voltage systems that create a vector into that pluripotent energy field that is at the baseline of space time. I, I guess very physics, but anyway, my point wow. is if someone has discovered this in their garage or their laboratory university, they should contact us because I now have people on my team who will be able to fund moving it forward, provide funding to that person so we can make them whole for their research and move it forward open source. Uh, so that's what we're wanting to do also in the next one, one to two years. If we can get these technologies out in the next couple of years, there's a chance it can then begin to change the geopolitical landscape away from the situation now where we're all dependent on oil coming out of terrorist states uh, and would also solve the world a poverty problem in about a generation. Because without that, we're going to continue to have global instability and terrorism because you can't have 3 billion people who don't have any means to live or 48% of the population of the world doesn't have indoor plumbing. I mean, those of us in the West are very myopic and not understanding the global situation. To fix those huge problems, we need a global equivalent of a Marshall Plan to move these technologies out because they should have begun to be deployed when Nikola Tesla discovered this in, in the early part of the 20th century. J.P. Morgan turned to him and said, if we can't put a meter on it, it's not going to come out. So it's been 100 years, right? It's 100 years of this kind of nonsense. So our civilization is 100 years behind what it should be. Now, we can make that up, but it's going to take a big effort by a lot of good people. And I think also some more serious uh, financial support. Well, hopefully we can do our part. We did a we did a whole documentary on Tesla and uh, and that particular energy that Great. he had discovered and and uh, was was you know taken from him. So, I would encourage our viewers uh -huh. to go check that yeah. out as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so your the new movie is called the Lost uh, the Lost Century. And uh, go check it out on Amazon and other places where you can stream at the Lost Century and how to recover it and looking at how we can try to reclaim this hundred years of where we could have had the access yep. to this energy and healthcare yep. and all of these major advancements. Um, and I would encourage all of you. about the health. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. What you said about health. I'm a doctor. I've been in an underground lab where they had these really ex very advanced energy technologies where they could regrow a limb or, or a severed spinal cord using these technologies. There are extraordinary medical applications in this wow. area. Now, wait, 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 wait. you were uh, in so a lab and you, not, you, you got to see, you, you got to see this in this underground lab. I can't say it was on a border state on the, I, mean, I think it wow. actually crossed into another country underground, but yeah, interestingly, it was a very interesting uh, trip that I took. I was invited to come there. They were working on these technologies. It was very sensitive. And uh, because I was a doctor dealing with this issue, wow. they thought I should see that there were applications 
for this whole area of science and technology that would be very transformative for medicine and health and healing. And being kept from all of us, this technology. And oh, yeah. So the biopharmaceutical complex can continue to make trillions and trillions of dollars and keep it from us. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Dr. Stephen Greer, I really appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully, uh, Thank you. you'll be a regular guest here on Redacted and we can uh, we can work on this together. I mean, I'd love to be able to get this message out there Great. and whatever we can do Thank here you. on Redacted to, to, to have this unredacted and to bring this to people, you know, <laughs> consider us right consider us uh, allies in this in this fight um so we appreciate your time tonight well, and i really appreciate and it and i appreciate your help thank you very much thank you doctor